This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Yeah, I guess we're here. Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> it is What Spoilers discusses the TV show season two episode deep dives. Hopefully not coming out a year after they get recorded this time. No, because we are being what I would call less ambitious, but at the same time, um, more realistic, right? We are going to actually, you know, produce these in our traditional podcast way, as opposed to trying to record video. Yeah, we're abandoning that nonsense. Yeah, that nonsense is just not worth it. Yeah, and so that's what we're going to do. So, uh, do we want to talk about what we actually came here to do? Yeah, let's get some socializing on with our dark friends. Um, yeah, so we uh, they released season two of the Wheel of Time TV show about two months ago. We watched all eight episodes, and we are attempting to basically talk about it. And I think what we're going to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, we are going to watch a few minutes of it, basically watch a scene, stop it, describe what we saw, talk about what we think it means and move on to the next one. And we're going to try and edit that together in a way that sounds um, not choppy and good. Aradia, how's that going to go? That I think is the plan. I think it's going to go great. <laughs> I'm looking forward to not trying to guess how the season ends as we go through. Yes. I think that's going to help us cut down on meanders that take 45 minutes and end up ultimately meaning nothing. Agreed. I'm looking forward to trying this again for sure. And this is only my, like, I rewatched the episode yesterday, but I haven't actually rewatched the whole season since it came out. I just watched it and sort of have put that on the back burner to simmer. And so this is like my first real go through again with Same. It. Um, e even less yeah, so. so I'm, I'm excited to get to talk about it as like a spoilery, you know, technically spoilers, but also like rediscovering it because a lot's happened since I last saw this episode, you know? I've watched the season once. That's it. This will be my first rewatch of the episode. All right. Well, okay. without further ado, let's get this on the road. So I skipped the previews. Okay, so we're hovering over this hut in the forest, and this was released before the show came out. And the only thing I have to say is this is Teller Run Riyadh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, has to be. Very cool, but very trippy. And in the show notes, it says that as well. Now, there's so much detail in this. It's going to be hard to know exactly how deep to go, right? I don't know if I want to stop and talk about every single detail of every single set, right? Yeah, it's going to be difficult to pick and choose, but um, there is one part of this opening sequence I wanted to point out when she's walking down the stones. It reminds me of Varen's like, three parallel lines. They aren't truly parallel, but still there's three distinct lines that are coming together into one thing. And I feel like that's a visual representation of Tal'Ai Ren Riyadh, right? Mm -hmm. We've got all the different worlds and then the one world that's in common. So I think that they're telegraphing very clearly that this is a dream, even though it wasn't clear on my first watch. And the little girl, do you know, is she Kyrianan? What is she doing here? I'm trying to figure that one out. Uh, I believe she is Tuatha on because of her dress and jewelry. And also she goes towards the Tuatha on skirts and says mom in the under the table scene. And um, also, I kind of wonder if maybe she's the child that like got murdered, you know, later in the episode when they when the they find the caravan that got killed and there's like the little girl that got to run away but like then she still got killed like i kind of wonder if she wandered into the dream in the course of being killed or something i have no way to prove that they don't even look the same particularly but why right <laughs> why and then we get i think a great scene of the trollocs running out of the forest which i think is just a fantastic use of the trolloc costumes mm -hmm. yeah very winter night in the first episode uh, we are we have confirmation that there are eight Forsaken, and we do figure out what all of their names are. Like, we're not going to get some of the Forsaken, but we know which ones we are going to get. Do we have all eight names? I haven't paid that much attention. Ooh, I, know we've um, got, like, I feel like we have a few that are still undetermined. We've had some named, but I don't think we've had them all named yet. But yeah, I I honestly am super okay with them switching from 13 to 8 you know 8 forsaken 8 people to shield like I'm super okay with that change it vibes on a lot of levels for me yeah 
just changing a magic number to a different one so they don't have to have as many characters. I mean, it did always feel like 13 was a lot of Forsaken for Rand to go through. It's a lot, and it's really tropey, and 8 being, like, the shape of infinity just turned on its side. Like, is there's just a lot of, like, no, yeah, that's good good conservation of storytelling energy. Mm-hmm. And I like the, so I think we got hints that it's definitely four male Forsaken and four females Forsaken, right? We're doing four mm, of each. Good. Balance. Yeah. And and the symbols on that ring make each of the eight, right, sort of match up. We know about, obviously, Ashamael, Lanfear, and Mogedian, right? We've seen those three. I believe Grandal gets mentioned later. Grandal gets mentioned. I'm pretty sure Samael gets mentioned. Pretty sure, yeah. So that's five. So that leaves three. A lot of the statues are very clearly somebody with a lute or a flute of some kind. That's that feels be like Asmodian. it has to be Asmodian. Rockstar. Right. And so then, you know, like there's, I think, one left and it's one of the women. It'd be like Semrog or. It's two left. Okay, yeah. We So we have one male and one female left. Dun, dun, dun. So possibly Demondred, possibly Semarog, possibly... Semarog makes a lot of sense to me. She's such a quintessential villain. The only thing is that Shamael took a lot of her positions in season one. Yeah, but the Lady of Pain can find another spot in the plot just fine. True. And she really is more relevant later on in the series. Yeah. They're making the Shanchan relevant during Shamael's reign, so, you know. Maybe they'll make the Sharans relevant and she'll get the Sharans. Or maybe the Sea Folk. Ooh. She's a Sea Folk. That would be interesting. We haven't seen the Sea Folk, even though we've seen the Sean Chan come in. I think the Sea Folk might be written out. No, there's been. I thought I saw a mention of them in like an AMA or something. Oh, okay. It bounced, bounced around a bunch of the discords. I'm pretty sure that they've been promised for season three. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're forsaken because they need one if they're going to be relevant is Samarag. That would work. Anyway. All right. So just a couple of questions. Um, who, who do we think is there? I think Soroth, Ingtar, and I'm not sure about the Aes Sedai. It, I want to go Varen or Leandrin. Yeah. I want to go Leandrin because she's the villain of the season, but that right. feels too easy. Right. Which, yeah, Varen would be the next logical candidate. And I would see Varen with that black glove, I think, would be interesting. Yeah, but I think that the Shinaran is Ingtar because, again, it's too easy when you see the corpse of the Shinaran later. And you're like, ah, clearly that means that we've gotten our one Shinaran dark friend out of the way. And I think that's far too easy. So I think that Ingtar must be at that meeting. Oh, well, and one thing I did hear is they filmed the whole Ingtar reveal as a dark friend thing and it just got cut. Which I fucking knew because it was edited together like a really bad podcast edit and i was (laughs) angry at it as an editor it just looked sloppy and bad to me and i'm angrily vindicated well and they set it up (laughs) even from this initial scene right they're already setting it up and it's crazy that they cut it with this kind of setup from the beginning yeah yeah i i saw that happening and it it makes me mad to be vindicated and then the other thing we see is that slingshot angry all on his finger i don't know what to call it but it's the two finger it uh, almost looks like brass knuckles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we always see Aes Sedai in the Age of Legends wearing it. I feel like it's like the old school Aes Sedai ring. That's what I've been thinking of it as. Okay. Do you think it's a, a Tarong Real at all, or is it just a, a fancy ring? Um, I hadn't really thought about that. I wouldn't be surprised if they got issued their own like personal Angreal kind of thing as part of their like Age of Legends graduation whatever you know it's kind of like a service revolver or whatever like maybe you just get one i don't know i hadn't really thought about that joe is saying that it is the aol i said i ring age of legends oh, okay so that makes sense all right so we get the reveal that of course fane is at the dark friend social Mm-hmm. somewhat disappointing to me this season which I guess is true to the books. <laughs> Thane is being disappointingly true to the books. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he is very threatening and very scary, but doesn't do a lot. Yeah. So I had questions about why 
what is happening here? Why is this girl allowed to wander in and no one responds except Ishi and Pod and Fane? And why is Ishi engaging with her? And why is Pod and Fane able to see it? But no one else is responding to it. It's like Ishi makes a bubble of dream to like interact with this child that stumbles in just because he's weird, but somehow Pod and Fane sees. Like, what are your thoughts? So this is Teleron Riyadh, which really makes me wonder how the little girl got in there, right? Like, I'm so okay. Wild theory, which I don't think is supported by anything in the show. Um, this girl was somebody, one of the dark friends, and he transformed her into a little girl the way Mogedian does to Lanf- uh, to Brigida, right? Oh, and then he's teaching her a lesson. Oh, well, that's creepy. Don't like that. That like this is the dark friend social. She was some one of the people who was there, or perhaps even the mind of the woman who she ran up to and called mommy. Right? Like maybe that woman's frozen and like put in the body of a child, and he's fucking with her. Well, that's way more fucked up than anything I thought of. <laughs> that's a stretch, though. That is a stretch. I think they they just said, "Oh, this is a dark friend. She has her kid with her." Ashamael took a break from the meeting to go scare her a little bit. And also, like, win supporters, right? That's what he's doing, right? He's he's converting her. Yeah, he doesn't really scare the kid at all. He very much invites her in. It's just, it's so strange how she's able to break in and in, and create no reaction from anybody except him. And then Pod and Fane. And it makes me wonder, like, what does that say about Pod and Fane's relationship to the dark and to Ishamael and his masters in general, you know? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that um, probably Ishamael froze everybody so he could deal with the child, and Fane wasn't held by that because he's got the power of the dagger, the power of more death. Mm, Oh, yeah, because he's got the dagger at this point, by the way they're telling the story. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I love it. I love this weird like nonsensical nonsense but i just wanted to know what tell i run riyadh nonsense you would come up with to explain it and i hate your version thanks <laughs> little girl's not a little girl just a person trapped in a little girl's body okay when he says what if he's just hungry you have to assume he's gonna feed the child to the thing absolutely absolutely i was very disturbed by his choice of words there so yeah, this this whole interaction is very weird. It also doesn't have a lot of payoff. It really is just like a cool cold open to make him very scary. Much like the meeting with the man called Boars, right? Like that much like the Dark Friend Social, it's just like... And anyway, moving on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did we see White Cloak in this Dark Friend Social? I thought we did. No. No, okay. No, there's white gloves on the table, so we, but not in that like under the table shot just white gloves resting on top of the table. So maybe, maybe, maybe that is a white cloak. Maybe that's all the evidence we need for a white cloak. I do wonder, though, about when he says maybe he's just hungry. Like, obviously, he's sort of talking about himself, too, right? Like, maybe the monster isn't a monster. He's just hungry. And I'm like, that's an interesting adjective for what Ishamael's MO is, right? He wants to stop existing. That's a hungry is hungry really the best adjective for that? I'm confused. He needs. He has needs. And his need is to stop existing. And you could say hunger is a need. Sure. Yeah. He He's just hungry to stop existing. Okay. But he is a monster. <laughs> so the important thing about this, I think, last shot is that what you see is the Quendiar seals that are later broken, right? Each one of those seals is what's holding one of the forsaken prisoner. And you see, I think there's one on the ground broken, right? Exactly. You see that one is free and there are others yet to come. They removed the intro. So it's just a short summarized wheel instead of the big long thing. Just for more runtime, I would assume. Yeah. I love her costume. Peasant Moraine is great. Oh, she's so pretty. She's so classy, even when she's dressed all poor. Uh Uh-huh. Like, with the hair sticks, you know? It's just great. Roseman Pike embodies being um, sort of nobility, no matter what she wears. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This very much feels like she's back to the days like pre-electricity, right? No power. She can't heat the water. She can't move things by magic. She has to do everything by hand. And, and it's almost like a a reversion in civilization. Yeah. God, she does such an amazing job telling a story without a single fucking word in this whole sequence. This whole sequence in the bath where she's obviously just devastated she can't channel. She's trying so hard right. to be able to channel, and it just isn't happening. And she can't make the bathwater warm anymore. She did it in episode one. She made the right. bathwater warm, right. and now she's stuck with carrying it up a hill and heating it with fire, and it cools down, and she can't do anything. And So sad. And this is without the pain of actually having been severed. Right. And I'm glad that we know that, that that's... The reality is she is just shielded and it's tied off. Now, the tying off being one of the weird uh, ancient things that only the Forsaken know, I can live with that being like one of the old powers. Yeah, I really feel like a lot of what they're doing with the power in this season is making the difference between modern and Age of Legends channelers less about raw power and more about knowledge. I feel like that gives them a lot more ability to do exposition and storytelling through the power and also to like narrow the gap between our like demigod evil people and our main characters. And I feel like that was always supposed to be the case. It was just it it felt like it was more of a few select weaves that got held back rather than like a whole series of knowledge. Right. But, you know, I feel like that was something that Robert Jordan really developed as he wrote the books. He kept building out his magic system and what had been lost. And, like, they're, you know, writing this with the benefit of the series being done and, like, backfilling how it would have made sense in Eye of the World. But he hadn't thought of it then. But, yeah, it is interesting that Moraine is experiencing an intense pain and depression from what's happened to her. But it's actually not... The intense pain and depression that someone like, say, Loghain is experiencing. Like, it, they are expressing it in similar ways, but either they've changed the rules around what that loss is like, or she's just really addicted to the power. Like, I, thi- I think they've changed the rules. I really do think that but basically severing and shielding are, to the person, indistinguishable. Once you're, once you're cut off... You know, you can't get across that gap, whether it's a wall in the way or the bridge is severed. It doesn't seem to matter to the experience of the channeler. I can live with that. I, I, I'm trying to establish new rules, right? I'm trying to figure out what the rules are because they are clearly changing the rules of channeling. I just want them to hopefully be consistent with the rules. Yeah, internal consistency is definitely the thing that I'm going to have a hardest time living without. They can make whatever changes they want as long as they hold steady to them. Well, not whatever changes they want, but most of them. <laughs> well, we've been holding steady on Land's shirtless torso for a while, so uh, are, are we right. going playing it? <laughs> yes, let's continue. <laughs> Badass Land training, also showing mm-hmm. his grief. Mm-hmm. And then a shot to Varen. The introduction of Varen, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was speaking at a perfectly normal volume. So who are Moraine's writers in this case? Like her informants, right? Yeah, they're the people who were coming to her in the mountains at the beginning of Dragon Reborn. So it's her eyes and ears that she's had around for decades. And I feel like this, this they're sort of combining a bunch of scenes here, right? So they're putting together... Moraine going to Adelius and Van Deen, but also Varen getting involved and Moraine getting her visitors in the beginning of Dragon Reborn. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. What do you think about merging Adelius, Van Deen, and Varen together into one sort of new family? I love it, honestly. Adelius and Van Deen, I love that they are one character. And Varen, I love, but she's such a free agent. She can totally, like, be attached to any number of things and still be doing exactly what she was doing the whole time because right. Varen. Um, right. So I think that Hornelius and Varendine 
is a, a great, <laughs> great merge. I love the conservation of characters. Um, I love that they're giving us like something more interesting personality wise with Adelius and Van Dien because they really function to deliver information. So it's nice that they're now also functioning to deliver personality. I really like it. What what about the horny sister? I love her. I love her so much. I love how unrepentantly horny she is. <laughs> it's great. And the introduction of Bail Doman. My customers usually do hey, be common doobie. to me. <laughs> ah, such a wonderful. I'm I'm I do like the use of Bail Doman in this uh, episode or in the season really. I really liked him. I wish that he had been able to stay with the Ileaner accent instead of just slipping back into Scottish after literally delivering one line. Sure. But I really like him anyway. I think he has an excellent hat. One thing, uh, if you ever do the audiobooks by Roseman Pike, she does Bail Delmont with the Scottish accent, and you go, oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I And I'm also a proof of them not giving him the Ileaner facial hair pattern. Yeah, like, the, the mustache and beard sucks. Not yeah. do that. My only disappointment, we don't really see him on the ship deck of a ship. Like, we don't see his, his ship at all. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get to see Spray after he's figured out how to make her able to go both on sea and rivers, and she's all spiffed up. The other thing I wanted to point out about this scene is that um, this is Varen's study. Oh, interesting. I'm, okay. I'm assuming. I'm assuming that Moraine has more or less taken over um, <laughs> Varen's <one of> study, <laughs> Varen's library study rooms. Um, and I remember saying, like early on, you know, I really want to be able to see Varen's study. That feels really important. And obviously, this isn't in the tower, but we are technically getting to see a room that I'm sure, for the past several decades, has been Varen's main haunt, and she's just, you know, loaning it to Moraine for the time being. It does, I don't see a lot of, like, the super interesting details. It just looks like a lot of candelabras and books and scrolls. Yes, it is more of a gesture than a proper thing. Maybe we'll see her quarters at the tower at some point and uh, get the human skeleton in the corner and all that. <laughs> <laughs> the owl. I hate how cold Moraine is to land. I don't understand why they did it, why they felt the need for it. It was feels unearned and dumb. Ah, this scene, this scene, this scene's so great. The tower, the tower, the tower, sorry. Yeah, we're in the tower with the, the novices doing chores. The first thing Egwene does is look long and hard at the Amarlin stole. Uh-huh. Ah, ah! I'm gonna wear that someday. It takes no brains to see what that foreshadowing is. Zero right. brains. <laughs> hard foreshadow with a smile. Uh-huh. And then this, honestly... One of my favorite scenes in the whole season is oh just God. giving us a walk through. Obvi obviously, Lelaine, Leanne throwing her dirty dishes was fantastic. Liana, yeah. Yeah, love Liana. I love Liana this whole season. She is just serving looks. It's amazing. But yeah, this whole walk through the tower day in the life thing is just top shelf. I love it so much. Should have been in season one. Yeah. Yeah, I was dying for lack of this in season one. I was so right. happy to get it. It makes the tower come to life. You see the courtyard, the warriors fighting, the novices watching them very intently. Mm -hmm. Notice how they very carefully didn't let us see any faces. No. Nope. They're like, nope, only hair. That's all you get. <laughs> They're nameless novices. You don't get names. And and nameless uh, warder trainees. Yep. Descending to the bowels of the tower where all the work is done. Mm-hmm. Into the kitchens. Half basement sunk down so the windows are up high. Ah, oh, such a good kitchens. I love this scene. I love the set, I should say. Yeah. I love that, that what their jobs are. I love just seeing what their actual work is. It's so cool. Hey, Zing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, like Wayne. Oh, Gwen, it builds character. Nynaeve, I have enough character. <laughs> that's so great. Wow, uh, Alana got dressed real fast. God, that's a cool dress. I want that dress so bad. And her jewelry. God, she's pretty. This is the only actual lesson we get, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. More training than we got in the books at this point. That's true. 
And for the first time, we're actually seeing different colored weaves of different threads, different kinds of threads. And how they flow differently. The earth is little grains and the water is drops. Like, they actually did work on it. It's great. And we see a practical application for the power. Right. Making clean water. Not just blowing shit up, but like complex, practical magic. And honestly, making clean water is one of those things that is, we don't realize how important it is. Mm -mm. Any idea who these novices are, unnamed novices? No. We'll see if novice number one. Yeah, they're just novices. Now, so Nynaeve has a block, right? Mm -hmm. Where did the block come from? Is it from the almost dying in the end of season one? Yes. She's afraid of her own power. She felt her full capacity and was so terrified she won't open up again. Poor so yeah, Egwene. this speech is the explaining why. Yeah. Oh yeah, poor Egwene. You have more power than most. Your Nynaeve, on the other hand, should outshine you by ten times your power, which is like, I think even more than in the books. I feel like in the books it's like two or three times the power, maybe, at the most. I forget. If you look at the levels, it's not... She's a couple levels above, but... Uh... Oh god, this part. I basically died. I basically died. I was like, this is perfect naive. Her drinking the it's dirty so water. so naive. God, just to get out so of the lesson. Naive. Yeah. I also love her shoulders in this dress. It looks like she's about to kick ass. Mm. Physically. Throw that punch that we always expect Nynaeve to throw. Yeah. Shiriam! Dark friend alert. Definitely <laughs> making Shiriam much more of the traditional old lady in charge of novices, right? Not yeah. the, like, the re young redhead <laughs> yeah. that, that she is in the books. Yeah, I I love that we're actually getting genuine age diversity because of the way they're doing the eyes to die. Because yeah, it makes way more sense for her to be the traditional like school ma'am or whatever, you know, the headmistress kind of energy. And yeah, you got to have a white bun to really be that trope. I love her earrings too. It, it does take her out of being friends with Suan and Moraine when they are novices, though. Kind of takes her out of that timeline. They've changed the ages of. A lot of the Aes Sedai who were all in the same age cohort, I mean, Leandrin also is no longer the same age, um, and I fucking love it because it was always annoying. It, fine, you can have one chosen one generation, but to have another chosen one generation, chosen one assistance generation, the generation before. The ones that were all 20 when Rand was born, right? Yeah. Like, I just, it stretches the Tavirian credulity too hard. It makes way more sense to me for them to be scattered across a normal distribution of ages, you know? By the way, damn. I know. Fuck. A the novice died in your care? more dangerous than in the books, I guess. Like, Well, no, novices do die, not infrequently. But it feels like Leandrin was clearly abusing them to become a dark friend and went too far. Right, and like... I feel like there's no doubt now that that's what Moraine survived. Right. Right? That that's what happened to Moraine, what she was telling Rand about at the end of season one. Like, she survived something that another girl did not at the hands of this woman. That makes sense. And that's probably one of the reasons why they have such an antagonistic relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, let's see. This Aes Sedai is Joya Bayar. Oh! The bald one. Oh, she gets a name. Oh, dark friend alert, dark friend alert, dark friend alert. Oh. Ooh, you sneaky, sneaky dark friend. I got my eye on you. I'm just pointing out that at this point we have Leandrin, Shiriam, and Joyar. This is basically a dark mm. friend meeting. The only person here who's not a dark friend. Alana. Is Alana, yeah. And then the unspeaking sisters who are also there. We don't know. Uh, so far as we know. Yeah. But do those three dark friends know that the other two are dark friends? Well, yeah, I mean, in the books, Leandrin knows who they all are, right? No, that's all Alviarin. Oh, fuck, I always forget that mixed up. I know, I know, they're very yeah. similar names. <laughs> Thank you, for, yeah, right. But are we getting Alviarin, or is Leandrin absorbing Alviarin's plots? Because she's not being merged with Elida. No, we do have an Elida coming. Yes, but Conservation of Characters said this, says that, you know, we, we're not going to get all the ones from the books. So if she's taking on all VRN plots, then she might know if she is actually head of the Dark Aja, the Black Aja. But the other two wouldn't. 
neither of the other two are candidates for being the kind of person who would know everything much they might not even know each other so even though it's three dark friends and alana it's not necessarily two different sides there's actually four sides potentially there at the same time i'm willing to bet that Ishamael, because his goal is to convert all of Rand's friends into dark friends. So he's behind the scenes pushing them as hard as he can. So I have to believe that she has orders. All three of them have the same orders to push Nynaeve that direction as they can. Right. Like basically push her harder than she should. So she turn needs help. Make her desperate. Right. So Leandrin suggests a Joya doesn't say anything to support Alana when she protests, and Shiriam, quote-unquote, allows just a talk, knowing full well that that's going to um, help with Ishamael's orders. Yeah, I can see it. Poor Alana. Possible. Yeah. And now, Perrin. Perrin! Writing letters that he should have written in the books. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the fur on Loyal's hands. I think that's really well done. <laughs> and they do some foreshortening to make him like look bigger and everything. But yeah, really enjoying Perrin here as the basically the hunter for the horn, more so than Matt. In a lot of ways, he's sort of going off to do that adventure with the Shinarans that Rand and Matt and Perrin all did together. Yeah, in many ways, Perrin is the one who's most with the Shinarans for that whole journey because Matt's dying and Rand is getting kidnapped by Selene. So to have the other two not even be here and to have it just be Perrin doesn't really make the hunt for the horn plot feel that much different because Perrin is like the only one who's actually present for the whole thing. Well, and Loyal, who is also here with Perrin doing that. Yeah, I'm really, really enjoying Perrin's entire character. Um, the way that, that Marcus Rockefeller is delivering him is just very, it feels very Perrin and the Great Hunt feels very the Great Hunt. Like It does. Yeah. It does. Uno, Inktar. Beautiful landscapes. Yeah, great landscape. And they're heading towards Falma, right? It, it kinda. Yeah, they're heading west, broadly. Right, they've been following Fane. There's been no sort of jump across the continent. They've literally rode across the continent together. Yeah, it's been months. They've been following the trail, losing the trail, keeping on, keeping on. Um, but yes, they are ultimately gonna end up at foam masima's in the background here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he's in the background of a lot of these scenes without a lot of lines but he's there yeah i was following him everywhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah uno's lines are fantastic oh, every line he delivers it's just so good <laughs> but a lot of this hunt for the horn is definitely told almost you know like oh this has been going on for a while yeah right exactly. like we we skip a lot of it yeah. In parents' POV. And then we get Elias. So we get uh, merge Elias and Huron. Yeah, R.I.P. Huron. I like that they merge him. It makes sense. Yeah, totally makes sense. Because they kind of call Perrin a sniffer for a while, and he uses his talent to duplicate it. And that seems to be what Elias is doing here. Yeah, they're like, why have two things when you could have one thing? Right, right. Love the yellow eyes. I think they did a really good job with that. I hate it exactly as much as I hated it in The Witcher. It just bothers me because it's so unnatural. But it looks fine if you're going to have unnatural yellow eyes. <laughs> it just bothers right. me. <laughs> I don't think I think The Witcher is much worse. I think they did a much better job in this show than they did in The Witcher. Yeah, sure. I just don't like it as a choice. But I, I accept it. It was well enough done. So we come up on the Tinkers who are killed by Fane, and he can see that. Oh, and yeah. that does look like the little girl. You're right. Right. So I'm wondering if, you know, she transitioned into the dream somehow as part of the nightmare in the waking world. I don't know. Well, he says she made it out. So maybe there was some... No, she made it out of the immediate kill. Right, right, right. So uh, maybe she made it out because she was a dark friend, because her mom was a dark friend, and she was ignored. But isn't she dead here on the ground in the scene? Oh, the little girl? Yeah. Oh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Am I just making that up? Because this is a Shinaran, right? Yeah. Oh, I guess I have no visual comprehension. That's cool. All right, so the little girl got away and then had a nightmare that night about what happened. Right, and she was protected by a wolf. She was protected by a dog. That's one of the dogs. A dog. Right, one of the dogs. Okay. Which I guess is different because in the, the books, the Tinker's dogs don't attack. 
Yeah, in the books, they are vegetarians, which is dumb. Right. And they changed it to <laughs> clearly show that they were hunters who could eat and that the, the Tuatha on were fine with that. And I appreciated that so much. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, I thought I saw the little girl on the ground, but I guess not. It's that the man and dog killed each other, but the girl got away. Yeah. And then dreamed herself right into a Shamael's meeting. God. Ingtar telling him that's enough, right? Because mm -hmm. he's a dark friend and doesn't mm -hmm. think, you know, has sympathy. Yeah. Elias being like, the fuck are you doing with these humans, Wolfie boy? Oh, there is a mention of the sea folk right there. Mm hmm So we're back to Bale Dome on a moraine haggling. And he's got Hearthstone that Lanfear delivered to him. Right. There's a lot of Lanfear setting things up in the background. I do appreciate that. When you go back on rewatch, you see a lot of what happened was Lanfear's doing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? She got the horn to Inktar. Yeah. And this is just a fun, like, I love the way they present, oh, the traitors are really good at what they do. He can bargain with the sea folk, and yet she still swindles him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by showing interest in something that's not valuable yeah or not valuable to her so some very nice tomato plants they are they look gorgeous the tomas is harvesting tomas harvesting tomats <laughs> tomas is so chill <laughs> yep this is interesting he's kind of it sounds like he's saying you should move on right like <laughs> little Jin, help pick the tomatoes. <laughs> Land's just standing there watching the old guy. I know, harvest. right? <laughs> Feels a very father son thing, though, right? Like the son stands there while the dad's sort of picking his tomatoes. Very much so. Moon dial. Moon dial. Because it's Landfear's. Legends around the moon lady mm -hmm. abounded. And that gives us a timeline for how long Landfear's been out. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And this is the poem that was written on the prison wall, right? At the end of, or at the beginning of The Great Hunt. Blood calls blood, yeah. She bargains them down on the one thing she cares about and doesn't buy the other. Mm -hmm. Not that she even needs the money, but just because she's good at it. Oh, yeah. And well, there's no point in wasting money. True. <laughs> His face. <laughs> the He's confusion. <laughs> it's kind of like... <laughs> If all you needed was um, mats for your car and you went to a car place and were like, I'd like to buy a new car and get some free floor mats. And so like, well, I'll give you the floor mats for free and you take them and then say, okay, now I don't want the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why is he being pursued by fades if he's doing what Lanfear wants? Because she wants to find Moraine. Ah. Or whoever is going to respond to that information, you know? Fair enough. Why is Lan... Well, yeah, is Lanfear just trying to set out a trap, or is she trying to get Moraine to read the poem? It does feel weird. Why is she giving Moraine the poem? Is it to try and bring everybody to Kyrian? Yeah, probably. Or to, to follow? No, because... Yeah, okay, okay. I bet I know why. Loghain is in Kyrian, in an asylum, right? And Barthanes is in Kyrian. And Anaver has taken over all of Moraine's spy network shit. And Rand is in Kyrian. And Lanfear's in Kyrian. So she needs to bring to Rand someone who can push him towards fulfilling prophecies. And she's easily able to figure out that there is an Aes Sedai with familial connections to the lake high up stuff in the web so she feeds information into that web god that feels like a stretch to me uh, wh why well i guess also the question is did she only send out that one chunk or did she throw out like 10 of those things just as a wide right. net hoping to catch someone but i'm still not sure to what end what who was she trying to attract re pushing rand along the path like, what is her end game with bringing anyone in with that poem? Like, set aside if it's Moraine or not. Why? I mean, yeah, it's it brings in the the dragon banner weave, but I've I've got no, can't figure out why Lanfear would want that to happen, or even a Shamael for that matter. Because when Moraine shows up, she kills Lanfear and pisses her off. You know, right? Which like very much goes against what Lanfear wanted to have happen, from as far as we can tell. 
yeah, as far as I can tell, like I don't think L- Moraine showing up fits her plan, which implies that she had some other plan. Yeah, I mean, maybe it does get Rand moving, but she it doesn't seem like she wants Rand to escape, right, with Moraine. Yeah, it's... To what end did she throw that out there, and did she throw it specifically at Moraine or at someone else? Or at sev- it, just anyone, and Moraine happens to be the one to pick it up. Or did she plan all that and wanted Rand to run away and get all excited, and, like, she's, you know, doing that whole set him up for a escape and chase him just to get him all worked up? I mean, she does want him to be the dragon. He does have to do certain growth arcs in order to grow into the man she wants to be with. So, I don't know. We'll have to try to parse that out as we go through this rewatch. What do you think about Nynaeve sword fighting with the warders? I love this whole thing so much. I think it's great that she's being, that she's engaging with them in a friendly manner, that she's using her body to work out her anger, like that women can fight. Like, I love it. That she can't learn to channel, so she's learning to fight with swords instead. Mm -hmm. Almost. And also that it gives us more time with the warders and their relationship outside of being with their Aes Sedai. There's just... I don't know. There's a lot that I like about this. It feels very appropriate to Nynaeve that she's the kind of person who can't sit still and meditate. She has to be in motion in order to be calm. Also, I don't like the whole warders get beaten up. I don't think that was part of being a youngling. There wasn't the hazing. It's part of being in a frat. I guess, yeah. I, I, I'm not super pleased with that. Oh my god, the whole you always make me feel like a third wheel. We are going to have such a heartbreaking death scene later that refers to that line. I'm already angry yep. about it. Do you think they're going to kill Ivan? I don't know. He's the one that lives in the books. So, don't know. That question of why'd you come here does always sort of, uh, I don't know. It never really works for an Eve, right? Because she came there to protect the Two Rivers folks, but then ends up becoming more Aes Sedai, really, than she intended to. Yeah, yeah. But it's an important question to set up, to see that she struggles with it. Okay, yes, the Egwene Alana <laughs> scene. <sighs> oh, God, this is so well done. It's so funny. Alana eating something. Very Alana. A pomegranate, no less. Yeah. Egwene's, like, attentive student posture, how she does the <laughs> smile and nod thing. Like, she's a smile and nod student. Ah! <laughs> she's definitely faking that. Mm-hmm. I recognize that face from when I also mm-hmm. made that face in chemistry and stuff. <laughs> and then she gets really confused. <laughs> Do you think Alana deliberately mistook the question? I think she knows exactly what Egwene meant to ask and was like, nope, I'm going to talk about threesomes. <laughs> she does say Egwene needs to loosen up. And she definitely means about channeling. But, you know, the mind and body are connected. Right. Also, I think her advice applies in both cases. It does. You have to focus on your own experience and then it flows through you. That is how channeling the power works canonically. So. And how many times have we drawn the comparison between seizing the one power and orgasming, right? Like there's a link between channeling yeah. and sex. It feels very fourth wall thinning right. of her to be doing that. I love Alana so much. And of course, Nynaeve then on her own practicing the weave that she couldn't do in public, right? Because mm-hmm. she does actually want to do it. Right. And then Leandrin recruiting. <laughs> five months. It's five months so we get a timestamp. Swan's lines. Yeah, I... I it's kind of sad that Leander takes Swan's lines, but it makes sense from the harsh love point of view. Yeah. And I mean, what a delivery that she gives us. Oh, yeah. And this whole scene plays out just like in the books, right? Leander puts uh, Nynaeve up against the wall, and Nynaeve responds by putting her up against the wall. Then she gets shielded, and it's still like it. Yeah. This whole scene is almost word for word from the books, just Leander's POV instead of Suan. And more sinister than it was in the much more sinister but yeah i like how they adapted 
Nynaeve's experience of how shitty this day was. Right. And then add in the, like, I'm showing you how powerful I am because I don't need a warder because I'm red, right? Yeah. And it does look like she's, you know, hurting her up against the wall, not just pinning her up against it, right? Yeah, yeah. Sucking the air out of her lungs with negative pressure kind of thing. There's the shield. Mm-hmm. This part. Mm-hmm. And the whole, there's only one way to become an Aes Sedai, when she's like, nope, you can use your anger. Very dark for, uh, dark side of the force, mm-hmm. right? Luke, use your anger type situation. And see, she has, she could barely have held Nynaeve any longer, just like Swan. Right, right. The way she walks away, like, ooh, ow. <laughs> she kind of staggers away, almost. Yeah, she's like, I, one more second of that, and I would have been called on my bluff. <laughs> yeah, just like getting off the gym, mm-hmm. getting out of the gym and, like, wobbling away. Nice. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, more of the graves too shallow to make any sense burials. We love to see it. Right, right. Also, he buries the dog. Elias buried the dog who defended the girl, gave him a candle and everything. Not wolfy disdain, but honoring of the four-legged friends. And Ingtar buries the dark friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, the, God, there was so much leading up to the reveal of him as a dark friend, and they just flubbed it. They flubbed it so hard. Because some fucking bean counter said that that was the wrong number of minutes for runtime. I love this conversation from Perrin. I do wish there was some explanation of Loyal and Uno's recovery from the dagger stab wound. There's an AMA answer to that, which is really unsatisfying. Oh, what is it? That they were going to have that be an arc, and then it just didn't work out because of where the various pieces were. And so they just had to decide to ignore it. Yeah. Not even a line, though, to dismiss it. And then we get some real, like... Perrin's afraid of becoming a murderer, right? He's afraid of giving into that rage and killing Fane for revenge. Yeah, it's a discussion he doesn't have in the books until book freaking 10 with Elias. Right. It's, I'm so glad to be having Perrin be explaining his struggle so much earlier. And then this, again, this conversation makes so much more sense if you know Ingtar's a dark friend, right? Because mm-hmm. Ingtar's saying, oh, he may have had a reason, basically saying, I may have had a, I may, I have a reason, even if you don't like it. There's a reason I'm a dark friend. I just, ugh. Land desperately trying to get some information out of Moraine. Moraine giving him nothing. You gotta push Land far to get him this frustrated. Yeah. And you can tell he's embarrassed by that Mm -hmm. display of emotion. And she's like, good, it's working. I almost have finished driving him completely away. But also her heart's breaking because she knows what she's doing. Yeah, and she's treating him like a servant to drive him away. Because she thinks she's still, she thinks, you know, her life is over, basically. She thinks he should move on and, you know, help another Aes Sedai, be somebody else's warder, I think is what she's basically thinking. Yeah. So she's just betraying their entire friendship in the name of his own good. It's so Book Moraine, and I hate it. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very Book Moraine. It's what she would have done if she'd been able to split herself after going through the stupid doorway. And now we're back to Egwene, because it's been a year, I guess, yeah. now since the show started. It's Beltine. It's Beltine. I hope they start every season at Beltine. <laughs> that would be actually pretty good. That that would please me. Oh, and Nynaeve forgot that it's Beltine. Like, she's getting so lost in in being away from home. Like, ugh. It's definitely her journey of, like, leaving the two rivers to help the... F- Emmonsfield 5, and really just becoming an Aes Sedai. Yeah. So yeah, she's now reading Perrin's letter. And of course, this is the ending for the whole series where they stand up against the Shamael. Yeah, the shield scene at the end with Perrin and Egwene. Yeah. Now, I would have loved to have seen more people contribute to the shield than just Perrin and Egwene, but this very much does feel like it's it's foreshadowing that hard. Yes. Yes, very much so. Definitely something I didn't catch on my first read through. Mm, mm-hmm. Or watch, I should say. Oh, I wonder what next year they're going to be doing together. <laughs> Not well. Mm. <laughs> we'll see in season three, cold open. Mm-hmm. They they were together at the end of season two, right? That was a reuniting yeah. moment. Yeah. And then the introduction of Matt 2.0. Yep. New Matt, who has apparently been imprisoned by Leandrin for five months. Five months? Yeah. And she's definitely editing those letters, right? Because Matt's mentioned in the original version of it. Not Matt Cawthon, just Matt. 
<laughs> well, she could also just be lying, right? She is a dark friend. Well, I think they wrote it that way, so that way non-book readers would be able to question it. You're closer to six months, really. Well, don't forget, he didn't. T he lost it for a while while he was still traveling with them. He went back to the White Tower to try and get it. Yeah, yeah. And he never got it, so... Yeah. I assume he hasn't been a prisoner for all those six months. Well, he walked back, and they went and did their Eye of the World thing, and then had to travel back not through the way. So presumably most of the time they were traveling back to Tarval, and he was already in prison. Sure. And that would have been about a month, probably. If, or less. I don't know. But yeah, he's been there slightly longer than them, is the point. Not by much. Right. So yes, uh, Lil'jin's six months in the Tower for Matt, so the assumption is season one took about six months. Sure. Give or take. Yeah. And then Perrin tries to let go of Layla and then decides he's not quite done yet. It's only been a year since she died, so not quite. Since he ready. killed her. It's, well, he's starting to transfer that guilt to Pat and Fane, though, you'll notice. Yeah, that's true. He's yeah. starting to rececognize that his killing of her was an accident in created by Pat and Fane, and it wasn't his fault. But he's still not quite ready to let her go yet. No. And no introduction of Fael this season. Which I'm super fine with. <laughs> She's going to be a journey. We don't need to rush things. <laughs> okay. Nynaeve saying I'm not going anywhere. Very important part of her arc, right? The whole she's not going to leave. And then, you know, she does repeatedly. Both in her imagination and in life. Yeah. Yeah. She does stay with Egwene. Well, she's like, I'm going to go to Falm. You can stay here if you want. I mean, that's her initial approach to Egwene is like, I'm going to go rescue them. Right. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And then, yeah, Matt's like, hi, I am Matt Cawthon. <laughs> I will not stay in my box. <laughs> it's very Shawshank Redemption. Yes, yes. It's exactly what Matt getting out made me think of with Shawshank. And they all think Rand's dead, right? Because Moraine did her I said I lie. Mm hmm. Yeah. But not only is he not dead, he's not forgetting what the day is either. No, nope, he's hanging his lantern. And so we flash to Rand Althor and Kyrie N. Hanging a lantern for everyone who thinks he's dead. And no hair, because he's shaved off his hair. To, so it doesn't look red, even though it still looks totally like red hair. I, I never really red. got that. Yeah, it's, it's super red. It's just red. short red hair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess Lillian said you could rub some dirt in it, make it brown, I suppose. Hmm. Preach! Preach! You are taking it too fucking personally. Mm, she's also treating him like shit, though. Yes, but still, <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> Technically, my house that I allow you to live in. <laughs> sisters. Sisters. Oh, Varen. <laughs> I love that Adelius is kind of the clueless sister and Varen's this, like, mastermind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, one's a hedonist, the other is devious. The description of being stilled is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. A little bit more brutal and direct. She's such a grandma, Varen is. She's so, like, wise and solid. Oh, Varen. Oh, Varen, don't undersell yourself. Right? Yeah, but she won't talk to him. She won't acknowledge him. There might be more than one way to communicate, but if Moraine won't participate, you can't have a conversation. Ugh, I hate this advice. I love this advice. I love that advice. Uh-uh. Because that's what Rand's doing. He's filling up all of the space with his hurt feelings and like why is she doing this he's not even engaging with that he's just engaging with how hurt he feels but it's been six months of him trying everything and being silent and listening i don't know if it feels a little he hasn't been silent that's the thing is he hasn't been silent he's been pouting without moving his mouth like, he's been out there working his ass off and, like, crying and just being wound up. Like, just because he's not speaking doesn't mean he hasn't been, like, very noisy in this. Fair. He's not actually trying to see it from her perspective. He's just being butthurt that she won't let him in. Which, like, yeah, it sucks. But, like, once he decides to actually start listening, it's like, oh, maybe it's really dangerous. And, like, I don't like where it goes, but I thought the advice was super solid. Right. This thing is, I'm like, how does the advice help him at all? He listens, and then she runs away from him, and he doesn't help her at all. No, he does help her, because she would have died if he hadn't gone back up there, seen she was gone, and realized what she did. Because he actually is trying to see things from her perspective for once. 
she would have died and that poem wouldn't have gotten anywhere if he hadn't gone after her, which he wouldn't have done if he hadn't slowed down to listen. But if she'd included him, he would have been right there with her to protect her. I'm not saying she was right. I'm just saying he wasn't being good either. To me, Lan feels way younger than he does in the books. This feels like New Spring Maturity Land rather than Eye of the World Maturity Land. Which I don't like. I'm, I'm not necessarily loving it, though I do love how Daniel Henney is working with it. But that's to me the difference is it's just younger Lan. All right. So quick pause. Just because I want to, we've sort of kept talking about land, but Moraine, meanwhile, has encountered fades. Right. So these fades were following Domon, but have not continued to follow him. They've been following the Heartstone and presumably now the poem. I would think the poem. I don't know how they're tracking the poem specifically, but. Or maybe they just follow Domon and like notice that he made a transaction and like then are after her. I don't know. I can write it off as a weird eye of the world as some sort of thing. Like, eh, the dark knows. Okay. Or perhaps Varen. They're hanging around for Varen because Varen's a dark friend. Ah, uh, the way that she takes them out makes me question if she was in on this plot, particular piece of plot. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I have the feeling it has more to do with the poem. But again, then then why is Lanfear sending it out? Is it to kill people who want show interest in the poem? That. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just like, hey. Maybe that's it. I don't want to kill anyone who might show any intelligence about this. I'll put it out there, put some fades on it, and have them kill anybody who buys it. You know what? I bet that's it. Because that is much simpler than anything else. That is very direct. Put out a bunch of clues that would let people know that it's time to activate for the dragon and then kill everyone who responds to that call. And then he has no allies. That would make sense for why Lanfear would draw out people that she ultimately gets foiled by, like Moraine. Right, because in the books, they're trying to get the seal away from Domon, but that's not at all what's going on. He's been given a broken part of the seal. So in this fight, I, I well, the first time I watched it, it was a little unclear, but there are three fades. And when Moraine stabs a fade, it doesn't die. It does come back. So there's three. I was having a really hard time counting how many there were. That That's my understanding, right, is that there are three. Because Domon said that there were two following him. Well, he saw two. And we only ever see Lan engaging with two at once. Mm, so, so far we've seen the one. Yeah. Let's see if we can track him at all. But yeah, it makes sense to me that she doesn't kill the one that she stabs, because like, all she does is stab it with a regular knife in the throat. Like That's not enough to kill a fade. And I do like their fighting style. That they pop in and out of the shadows while the fight is going on. Yeah, I thought this was so visually satisfying for how fade fights get described. Very cool. And also, I just love the fact that she is willing to stab one in the face. Well, sure. Like, I do love that about her. Yeah. Oh, it only really goes through its throat and into its mouth. Yeah. And then she steps back like that's enough. And it's like, come on, girl. All right. And obviously, Thakandar blades don't necessarily cause instant death the way they do. Because she gets a nice stab. Yeah, she gets a good gut wound. She definitely is going to need magical healing. Mm -hmm. So the, he beheads that one that was standing over her. So that's one dead. Yeah. Okay, so did two just pop up out of the shadows? Yeah, he's fighting two at once here. Okay, so yeah, that's the one that she stabbed plus a third. Because the one that he beheaded is still dead, I assume. Yes, yes. We're going to assume beheading is, is a successful way to kill a Murdral. Yeah. I love the biting like a shark yeah, Murdral. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, the sound was so scary. <laughs> He's taken some more of those hardcore scars in this fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, there is the body next to her. Yeah. Yeah, there is the body next to her, yeah. So that there's three as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems pretty accurate. I like that we're showing off Lance's fighting abilities, and also it gives the Murdral a little bit of a threat that two of them can really make Lan work for it. Yeah. So it looks like he killed the second Murdral there in that spinning fighting move. Mm. So I think there's only one left. That makes sense, because we only see Tomas kill one. Right. Oh, and then it says Fade's snarling in the captions, but yeah. who knows? Oh. Captions are not perfect. No. Last most desperate attempt to channel. And you figure if she can get through the shield, it's going to be now, right? And then the little sparks. And then oh. her face tells you that that's not actually her. It's actually yeah. Varen. Varen. Yep. And that's where she gives Tomas's sword the flame. And he 
stabs that fade through the back. Yeah. I do like the flame sword. I thought that was a pretty cool yeah. way to do it. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. And I like the warder. Uh, they do more warder Aes Sedai fighting together stuff, which I think is is really cool. I like the way that that's not really in the books. The way there's not like a lot of Aes Sedai enhancing their warders. It's more like the warders are fighting at their backs. Yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying seeing more mechanics of how they can work together. I love how they're both like ER, need to go to an ER, you know, obviously get healing. But he's like, tell me what's going on. And she's like, nope, not going to do it. Yeah, it's it's so much that like he's doing everything. He's listening. He's waiting. He's he's doing everything. He's saving her without knowing what he's saving her from. And she still won't talk to him. It's so much anger making. God. We did the episode, and that took us only an hour and 42 minutes. You said we could do this in two hours, and I was not sure, Yeah, but I, I, you're right. As long as we're doing a little bit of talking over the show, which is fine because we're just recording ourselves, and I'm describing what I'm seeing, right? A lot of times we can, we can get what we want to say in while we're waiting for the show to sort of get through the scene. Yeah, I felt way more relaxed about that recording process than what we've tried to do last year. Oh, well, last year we were trying to do, uh, we, were, we were concerned about our video and syncing up with the video and putting that together in a way that made sense. It, no, it was so, it was way, way too much to tackle, yeah. I think. I also feel like I just am a little bit more chill this year. Like, I don't have to analyze every single stitch and every single frame. We can just kind of sure. allow certain things to pass over. And, like, we, don't, we didn't necessarily mm -hmm. talk about every single line of dialogue, and that's okay. And every single thing on set, right? We're going to get to the stuff that matters most to us, and it's fine. We don't have to be exhausted. This is something I'm trying to make myself learn. <laughs> Do you want to look at the four-minute extra? Sure. For season one, for this episode? I haven't seen that, so sure. I haven't either. All right. Let's see if it's worth uh, talking about. Spoilers ahead! <gasps> wow, it's our calling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cabal of Dark... Come on, call it the Dark Friends social. Don't call it Cabal of Dark Friends. <laughs> Cabal. There's an Aes Sedai at the table. Yes, yes. Rosemond Pike talking about how they're all doing individual quests. Rafe saying we are really... Not having Rand as the main upfront character in the beginning, which this season episode was definitely not about Rand. Yeah, talking about Egwene's jealousy. I didn't necessarily see the jealousy in the books. Yeah, it's very vaguely hinted at in the books. Do you see the snake ring on her finger? Yeah, I did. I did. So far, most of this is pretty recappy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm. that right there was more of an explanation than I feel like I ever got in the season. She says... Rosamund Pike says. <laughs> Rosamund Pike says, not Moraine, but Rosamund Pike says that Moraine is icing Lan out because she doesn't want him to die with her. Yeah, because she's convinced she's going to die eventually of being stilled, which is what she thinks happened to her. And she's sure that that will take Lan down with her, so better to drive him away so he can live okay thank you rosamond i guess that will do thank you rosamond pike that wasn't clear from the season but i'll take it and for us it's very confusing for him and for us oh so he's saying that the fades fight is an homage to the one do you remember that one where thomas and lan both stab the drakkar at once and they say isn't like for honor or something like that yeah and if you'll recall they moraine and lan are in the middle of a fight when that scene happens they are actively fighting. That's when Moraine says, like, doesn't your, you know, leash chafe? I'm going to be sending you to my rel. Does it bother you that I can do that? Like, she is actively, like, breaking down his walls and investigating how he feels about Nynaeve. And she kind of regrets having to do that. And he goes stomping out to work the forms with Tomas. And then the two of them arrive and deal with the Drekkar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's but it's because he split his loyalty to Rand and Nynaeve, which is not what we're seeing here. She, yes, yes, there correct. she's like, what's going on? Why are you why aren't you supporting me? You really seem to, to be splitting your loyalties here. She's basically saying, I don't want your loyalty because it'll kill you. 
Right, yes, it's a very different fight. But yeah, I hadn't even thought of this as being a parallel to that scene per se. I was just so caught up in the the what the fuck of it all. But hearing Rafe say that, like, I can see the connections that they were trying to draw. And they really are just saying being shielded and being cut off are the same. Like, she can't bond land, somehow that's cut off. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, in the books, we do get... A couple of comments, I think from Elaine and also Nynaeve, that one of their greatest fears when being shielded is that the power will never come back. And that's a thing that happens, like when they uh, get drugged with fork root. And I think also when Elaine gets shielded um, once she's queen and doing all of her I'm pregnant and invincible shit. Um, there's times when they comment, like, being shielded, the only thing that makes it not terrible not as terrible as being stilled is that they know it will come back. And like, that does seem like a bit of an exaggeration on their parts, but I could see them deciding to lean into making that more real for the canon of the show. You know what I mean? Sure. They're simplifying a lot of things. They're basically saying these things are the same. Yeah. And we're not going to really explain the difference. Like this one's temporary. That one's permanent. But all other than that, they're the same. Right. She's cut off. She lost the bond with Lan. It doesn't exist anymore. And and then also, likewise, Loghain being able to see weaves after being gentled is not how book canon works. Like they're being stilled is less. You lose less than in the books. So, again, it's like they're just narrowing the differences on stuff. They're narrowing the gaps between things. Even when they're not blending them entirely, they're still making them closer to each other. Right. Right. Which uh Which is I different. mean I guess does save you some time of being having, you know, characters explain all the rules, but uh, Yeah. Again, I'm worried about the internal consistency. That's all. Right. Yeah. It's like it's kind of a wait and see, like, you know, as the seasons progress. Because like first season you were upset that there wasn't enough channeling flow distinction. I said, well, season two, we're going to get training montages. So we're going to get more explanation. And that's happened. So like they could continue to be internally consistent and make it make sense. But a little hard to see that. I, I don't know. It's it's different enough that I'm just curious what they're going to do with it. And I really hope they're internally consistent because movie magic is very rarely internally consistent. Right. And, and and yeah, and I will say, like, the weave thing, oh, well, we got training montages so they can see. They didn't really make that explicit. They really, I mean, especially with, like, Moraine being the one who was channeling in season one, it feels like she should have been able to see the colors. Yeah, we were working through the POVs of people who didn't know how things worked yet. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like, I don't know. I don't, I, I just, they... They have shown that they're going to be able to add to the rules as they go rather than just dumping out all the rules in the first season. So we have room to see them being consistent or not. And Chad is pointing out that most men can't. Well, no, because Rand can see the weaves. They're saying Loghain can see the male weaves due to a talent, but Rand can see I them. I thought it was that Loghain could see that Rand could channel as a talent. Hmm. That's something that, again, they're changing, that channelers don't inherently know other channelers, but Loghain has that as a talent. That was what I recall the canon being from my one watch through. Yeah, that's the yes, because he, he's like, I have the talent to see the glow. And that glow wasn't Taviran, it was a channeler. And it's not something that other channels, channelers see, generally. Right. But women can tell when there's another channeler, right? I don't think they can. Well, then how does the Domani point out the channelers? Oh. Shit. Right. Well, I guess I was just making that leap, and I don't actually know what evidence I had for making that leap. So that might have just been me fucking up. So again, people are saying that the woman needs a talent, and Suri is one oh. of the few that has the talent. Well... That would be an extremely valuable and much praised Damani amongst the Shan Chan, one that can it sure find would be. other ones rather than having to just test women by brute force, forcing them into the collar. I mean, you can always sweep up some cool power as a talent and then just have that be the hand wave for it. Like the books have a very good mechanic for explaining inconsistencies as capital T talents. They're also changing the learner versus sparker. Because all Sean Chan Suldam 
are just weak channelers. There's no learner versus sparker thing going on there. Honestly, I'm fine with that. I always found that to be sort of an annoying distinction in the books that didn't feel like it helped with the world building at all. So fine. Because it feels like if you're above a certain power, you're going to spark, right? Yeah. And RJ put so much emphasis on height and power and willpower and strength of character all being together that like, I'm okay with them breaking that up and shaking up that association a bit. I'm fine with that. It's refreshing. <laughs> Okay, so episode uh, wrap up thoughts. Do we anything else we need to to cover um, about that? Mm, not that I can think of. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, just I think it wasn't. Uh, you know, going back and watching it, it wasn't quite of as strong as an opening as I remember it being. It focused pretty heavily on Moraine and Lan. I'm glad that it came out with the first couple of episodes, even though I've said that it's not necessarily the best way to do it. I think I wouldn't have liked that episode as much if I hadn't watched it with the next two as well. Because really, I think a lot of like, oh, Rand and Lanfear and Matt and his interactions with Min and, you know, Nynaeve's testing. Those are the things I remember from the beginning of the season that I really like. And none of that is in episode one. Yeah, I I watched them one episode for three successive nights. I didn't watch them all in one go because I really wanted to savor it. But yeah, I agree that there was this would have felt I don't know. I really enjoyed it in the way that I enjoy the opening of Wheel of Time books where it's like, I, I feel like I'm settling down into a chair. I've got my comfy blanket. I'm reading all the exposition paragraphs and doing all the recap and like nothing really exciting is happening yet, but like, that's okay. Cause we're just getting reacquainted. I'm there with you. Yeah. But also I really don't super like the land moraine plot and because that's what we get a lot of focus on and i really really like the white tower stuff there is definitely a little bit of that unsatisfying like take me back to the slice of life in the tower and get me out of this like weird emotional manipulation that feels low even for book moraine you know and my favorite part of those scenes are always varin Oh my god, Varen. Oh my god, Varen. I love Varen. I love Varen. I love Varen. God, I love Varen. Uh, I just... And Liana, just the way she walks down the hallway, her costumes this season, <laughs> her costumes and her looks and her just everything about her. Oh, is totally. Just like, uh. I'm honestly really interested to see what they do with her when she loses the power. Mm -hmm. I think because she's this... They've made her this really haughty, very arrogant... Aes Sedai. Yeah. Yeah. Just the highest and mightiest of any Aes Sedai ever. Who sits in her power really smoothly and knows she's powerful. Ugh, I just I love the tower stuff. All the tower stuff just makes me so happy. They've they've been nailing the Aes Sedai. They've yeah. really nailed Even the, Aes Sedai, the White not in Tower in the, the Aes yeah. Sedai. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They th I really do think that they've done a great, great job with the Aes Sedai. I'd like to see them do more with, like, the Aiel. I'd like to see them do more with all the other cultures. And, you know, I, my complaint that I always complain is more episodes, longer episodes. There's so much that they could do with what they have that's just not getting included. The Aiel wouldn't have been included in great detail at this point anyway. Plot-wise, they're meant to be left no, until later. No, no. But, you know, I, I miss Gaul. Sure, sure. But like at this point, this is about how much detail we're supposed to get for the Aeol. Those mysterious people that show up, murder, and then invite us to read another book. And, and I will say I miss the male mentoring relationships in the show. There's a little bit of Perrin and Elias, but it doesn't last very long. You know, we don't get Rand and Lan. We don't get a lot of good even friendships between the boys right i don't like the friendship between matt and rand right it yeah that's, that's all i just i miss the you know tom that he was a male mentor that's just not in in this episode in this whole season right so just just something to consider when i when i think of this season is just like 
there aren't a lot of men learning from uh, the, the, a lot of the, the themes of father figures, which I think is a big theme in these books, right? The whole beginning where you have um, Rand and his father in the forest and he's constantly wondering, you know, you know, no, he is my father. I know. Well, maybe not, but no, Tam is my father. It, it, it just, it's, it's, I miss it. That's all, you know, it, it feels like a big theme and one that was important to me reading these books growing up. Um, and having emotionally distant parents, you know? I feel like they really undercut a lot of the relationships, period. I don't think it's... Yes. I don't think the men yes. got singled out for it. I mean, we've got Ivan and Maskim giving us far more male relationship than we ever saw from any of the fucking warders in the books. But then you've got Elaine and uh, Gwaine developing a friendship basically entirely off screen. And Nynaeve and Elaine developing their entire relationship almost completely off screen. And we're expected to believe in those relationships, but I don't have any real reason to believe in them. So it's like they're there superficially, but they're not believable. It's, it's, it's what I said in our season overview in our tangents episode is it felt like all set up and no payoff. And I feel like, yeah, the male relationships, they're just going to get shown at some point to have been existing this whole time without right, ever right. having earned that. And that's where I go back to more screen time, right? I want, I want bottle episodes. I want side episodes. I want, I want the episode where Lan and Rand, you know, get lost traveling somewhere and in the end it reveals Lan knew where they were the whole time because he could tell where Moraine was and he was just testing <laughs> Rand and they don't nothing changes except it's Lan and Rand off in the forest talking philosophy and maybe they encounter some Trollocs that they have to kill or something like that you know and save a, a village or a, a, a farm yeah though in fairness I feel like RJ did a lot of implying of that he sort of retconned it into existence sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, but you that you traveled with them. You traveled with them. And and a lot of the training was happening during the travel. Yeah, and, and yeah, the algorithm does not allow for travel episodes anymore. No, it doesn't. And that's, it doesn't. And that's the real shame of it is yeah. that we're just not being allowed. Where's the beach episode? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Give me a beach episode. Give me a high school episode. Yeah, and like, <laughs> no, and the, the thing with Tomas was like, it could have been a fatherly mentor thing, but there was nothing to indicate that these guys had known each other for more than like five months. There was no like mm -hmm, referring mm -hmm. to years of them growing up together or that time I bopped you on the head when you were a child or like anything that would have indicated an off-screen relationship. It was just, I'm going to dispense some long-suffering fatherly advice and then that will be it, will be that. I'm beginning to think we're not even going to get a musical episode. <laughs> Thanks, little Jen. On that note. Yeah, episode one, um, strong start for, a, you know, we're going to be here for a minute. Uh, I think a st pretty strong season. Um, doesn't mean we're not going to have, you know, things to say that we don't agree with or things that we thought could have been better. But um, certainly think season one mm, improved into season two quite a bit. Oh my god, it's just every frame is so much higher quality than season one. I'm very content with mm -hmm. that. Um, and I'm looking forward to going through it in this way. I think it's going to be more fun. And despite a few raw edits, I think the editing is quite a bit better as well. Yeah, as an editor, I'm, there's some that I just... You see them now. I should get into movie editing so I know how bad it is. So I know how much I'm talking <laughs> out of my ass. No, <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. It's, I've already ruined podcasts for myself because I can hear all the edits. Ugh. Um, I, I don't even want to do it with TV. Yeah, seriously. Um, so yeah, props, hats off to all the creatives that uh, made this show. Definitely still want to support the ongoing strike of the writers, actors, the actors, the continuing strike from the actors. And I'm just really glad that we're getting to see this and engage with it all together. And we will see you guys next week for episode two. Next week, episode two. Bye.
what's up? How's life since the last week when we talked? Because we haven't actually had a break in recording. Uh, um, we threw a party for uh, our old neighbors. They had a birthday party. So that was that was fun to sort of celebrate and, and have way more people at my apartment than I'm used to. Yeah, no, it was just it was like we threw a party like we were in our 20s again, man. It was fun. I drank a little bit, which is the first time in a while. Our neighbor asked us to be quiet, so check that box off, right? Excellent. <laughs> we had that that amount of um, fun, so that's that's pretty much where that is. And then I had a day of recovery. Um, I crocheted a headband for my girlfriend. Your fiance. My fiance, yes, my fiance. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> My future wife. I hate the, you know, fiance is such an awkward way to put it. Like, I almost want to say future wife or just get it over with and say wife, like, or girlfriend. Like, fiance is always going to be temporary. Yeah. But it's the same thing as saying future wife. Just French. <laughs> just French. That makes it fancy. It's fancier that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of wedding planning, actually. I mean, uh, more b wedding brainstorming than planning is what I would say. Sure, sure, sure. You got to throw stuff out and then pick out and organize what you want from that. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of things that, like, I don't like the traditional marriage. Just the whole structure of it kind of sucks, right? Like, it just feels very much like a property transaction, Rather than like which a celebration. Uh, yeah, which it is. And it shouldn't be. So I'm trying to eliminate as much of that as possible. So I'm thinking about like having us, you know, we're doing pictures beforehand. So there's not going to be like, oh, my God, he sees her for the first time. We're thinking about walking down the aisle together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brandon and I did that. We walked in together. Yeah. And then also like maybe having her mom walk my dad and vice versa down the aisle behind us. Oh, that'd be nice. To, to symbolize the meshing of the family. Exactly, exactly. Also, like, getting our parents away from each other. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's symbolic. It's purely yeah, it's, symbolic. It's There's purely nothing symbolic. strategic uh -huh, about this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's ideas. But also, we're, you know, we are pretty sure we're doing a taco buffet, right? Because we have, mm -hmm. like, ta tacos are cheap, and they satisfy a lot of people's dairy requirements, and you can build your own, and, you know, that, um, a small cake for us, and then, like, little individual pies from the pie spot for dessert for everybody else. Um, we have a pretty solid guest list, right? We basically made two lists. Everybody who we're pretty sure is going to show up, and everyone who we should invite, and the difference was, like, 50 to 75 was the range. Nice. So we have a pretty good, like, we're dialing in details as we, like, dig through it. Um, you know, fortunately, I just don't have that many people. <laughs> <laughs> her her side, I'm like, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm, like, stretching. I'm like, I guess I could invite my college roommate who I haven't talked to in 10 years. Uh, and I'm, like, trying to get to, like, 15 people, you know. And she's like, oh, I'm trying to keep it under 50, you know. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's just the the size of our social circles. And, and a lot of her friends are my friends. They're just her friends first. And, you know, she has five sisters, all, all you know, five siblings. So there's five, uh, five sisters and a brother. You know, two sets of parents and a partridge in a pear tree. I mean, there's this, this everybody, <laughs> right? Right? So the... And, and then the whole, like, uh, just all the hurt feelings and stuff around who gets to do what as part of a marriage is just something that's I want to avoid as much as possible but yeah at the same time you don't want to spend a lot of money so mhm mm mhm mm yeah yeah well i i believe in you you'll survive it'll be great <laughs> it'll be unique it'll be you it'll be you guys will be great it'll be fine you'll get through it and then you can just say wife and and it'll be simple forevermore Yes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I am I'm convinced that we're going to um you know, I'm gonna get her to go sign the paperwork at a time, right? And then maybe I can just be like, and let's just skip the rest. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. We we signed our paperwork first and then went and did all the things. Yeah, that that sounds really nice and um focused. Can you tell I'm a little excited? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's great. Um it's a lovely Lovely thing to hear about. 
I also went to a party over the weekend. Yeah. Um, but it was the work hard, party hard kind of party. We went over to our friends' land with a bunch of other people, and we did a whole big work day with, like, I don't know, 10, 15 people all putting in, like, a good half day's worth of, like, hard work. I stacked so much wood. I'm still sore. Um, but I love filling woodsheds, like, with the puzzle <laughs> piece. Like, it's my it favorite is fun. thing. So, yeah. like, you know, I just got truckloads of wood that had been split already delivered to me at the shed and me and this other woman were just like stacking it all for hours and there was all this other work happening another guy was making food in the kitchen all day like that was just his job was just to cook because there was so much need for food it was great and then we all you know partied hard into the night had a big old pallet fire because it was out in the woods and you can do that sort of thing and that was really really nice it was a very like chop wood carry water don't think about what's happening halfway around the world sort of weekend but then this week that's all i can fucking do i am so <laughs> fucking do you want to talk about that at all here but it was a nice weekend i i i just want to say it sucks mm -hmm. okay it just i'm so fucking upset with all the death and anger and propaganda and bullshit and i have nothing useful to say but also my taxpayer dollars are making it fucking happen and i just i can't stop vibrating about it today hmm. it's so and i don't even have any living family there i just have like one person who went there and you know died as a you know grandmother like is buried there but it's just i don't know i don't even have anything useful to say i just want to say i'm fucking mad about it and i'm escaping into wheel of time with all of you okay <laughs> we're just and that time stamp that fucking thing is is happening and ruining everything but um chef would carry water be with your friends and don't fucking vibrate about it too hard think about wheel of time i don't know i don't know i just needed to get that out i you know i've, I've had a weird it feels like everybody in my life is deliberately ignoring it. Like this, there's, there's this whole like almost conspiracy of silence to be like, you know what? It's yes. too hard to talk about. So we're just not going to, we're just going to pretend like that's happening, you know, over in the Gaza Strip and, uh, we don't, no one knows how to talk about it. And, and I'm, I'm on that page too. You know, I'm like, I'm right there. Like, I have no idea. It's two people have been awful to each other for hundreds of years and continue to be awful to each other in new and creative ways. Um, fuck. <laughs> I mean, really, it's, 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 it's so much fucking imperial meddling. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And, and like, that's why it's like, that's part of what the whole fucking conspiracy of silence is, right? Is like, here we are being complicit in yet another genocide. Like, we're no one to talk, to criticize, right? Because we've done it like a bazillion times. But also, like, we're literally funding it because it's so fucking asymmetrical and so obvious what's happening. And if we all just sit to the side and worry about what we're going to say, then it just happens in front of us, like the fucking bystander effect on a planetary stage. And it's like, but then also... Has, has anyone checked in with fucking the Tigray region? How's Haiti doing? Like, it, it just, I I can't fi ever figure out what scale I'm supposed to work at. You know what? I, I'm, I'm sick of talking about a people who were driven off their land and have reclaimed it at the cost of the natives who have lived there. In the meantime, I want to talk about the Sean Chan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent segue. <laughs> God, episode six is going to be really hard. <laughs> it's going to be pretty hard, yeah. Yeah, especially in the current context. Um. <laughs> uh, I just... Uh, okay. Whew, let's just shake it out and fucking... Huh. I don't, I just, I needed to get something off my chest, but I don't want to dwell on it because I don't think that's what any of us are here for. And I'm not going to solve anything by taking up space. So. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?